Hello, thank you. So we're about to start our last panel of the day. And as should be quite obvious uh, to anyone here, I think 10, yeah. Ken's curiosity was pretty infinite. And even with more than 30 speakers today so far, we haven't touched on all the topics in which he made really important contributions and, and drove thinking in, a, in new directions. And so this last panel will, will go in, in broader directions. We'll be hearing about operations research. We'll be hearing about the environment. We'll be hearing about democratic theory. So we have uh, quite a bit of, of ground still to cover. So without further ado, we'll, we'll start with uh, Dick Cottle. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizers. Some few of you in the audience may be wondering, what is operations research? The Economist and operations research, Alan Mann, once said, operations research is about doing the best you can with what you've got. I've now got less than 10 minutes, and so I'll leave it at that, except for saying that operations research uses and contributes to economics, mathematics, statistics, computer science, engineering of all kinds, medicine, and business administration. Kenneth Arrow produced an enormous amount with what he had, namely education, native intelligence, and unflagging energy. We are all beneficiaries of this ideal combination. Now, at the end of a long day, it can truly be said that less is more. And so I will concentrate on just three of Ken's impacts on operations research in a broad sense. First, early OR op, uh, publications. Second, creation of the operations research program at Stanford. Third, organizational recognition of his impact on the field. So first, it's obvious that his book, a Social Choice and Individual Values, and his paper, Existence of an Equilibrium for a Competitive e uh, Economy, with Gerard de Bruy, topped the list of Ken's most influential publications. However, Ken's World War II military experience as a researcher in the Air Weather Service led to the publication of his first paper on the use of winds in flight planning, quite possibly an operations research article. Ken's alternative proof of the substitution theorem for Leontief models in the general case appearing in the Proceedings of the Conference on Activity Analysis of Production and Allocation, edited by Koopmans, may represent his earliest contribution to the nascent literature of operations research. Ken's consulting experience at the RAND Corporation led to fruitful collaborations, such as the Bayes and Minimax solutions of sequential Decision Problems by Kenneth Arrow, David Blackwell, and Abraham Gershik. Another paper is the Optimal Inventory Policy by Kenneth Arrow, Theodore Harris, and Jacob Marshak. Both of these papers appeared in Econometrica, but they could have appeared in operations research journals had there been any at the time. Also of great importance to operations research are three books he co-authored and co-edited during the late 1950s. These are Studies in Linear and Nonlinear Programming, Arrow, Horwich, and Ozawa. Ken is the author of five of the 15 papers in that collection. Next, Studies in the Mathematical Theory of Inventory and Production by Arrow, Carlin, and Scarf. In this case, Ken co-authored seven of the 17 papers. And finally, Mathematical Models in the Social Sciences, co-edited, co I should say, by Arrow, Carlin, and Supis. 
based on talks given at a symposium held here at Stanford in 1959. The social sciences addressed in this volume are economics, psychology, and management science, the latter being another name for operations research. These books illustrate the remarkable breadth of Ken's knowledge. They also demonstrate the ability of scientific methods to provide a rational basis for action in diverse fields of application. Turning now to the creation of the operations research program and embellishing a little of uh, what Mordecai said this morning. In the late 50s, 1950s of course, uh, it was clear that operations research was growing in military and civilian importance. Academic programs in operations research had already started at a handful of American universities. Ken Arrow and a group of Stanford faculty recognized the need for and the possibility of creating a PhD program in operations research using existing, and I emphasize existing, faculty resources. Ken Arrow and Jerry Lieberman approached Albert Bowker, then dean of the graduate division, with such a proposal. In January 1961, Provost Fred Terman created an ad hoc committee to study the status of operations research at Stanford. Terman appointed Ken as chairman of the committee for the 1960-61 academic year, and Jerry Lieberman followed as chairman for the 61-62 year. The committee made a formal report to the provost in late 1961 advocating the creation of the program in operations research. Once approved, the program in operations research was launched in September 1962 with Lieberman as chair. The committee in charge consisted of Ken Arrow, James Howell, Sam Carlin, Jerry Lieberman, Herb Scarf, Dan Tykro, and Harvey Wagner. Before becoming a full-fledged department in the School of Engineering, uh, the, in 1967, this program added other faculty, Stanford faculty, that is. These included George Danzig, Fred Hillier, Don Eigelhart, Rudy Kalman, Alan Mann, Pete Vinat, and myself. A large number of existing affiliated faculty were annexed as well ultimately making the department arguably the foremost one of its kind. And its kind, by the way, to a very large extent was focusing on the mathematics of operations research. At least it was thought of as a mathematical science department. Evidence of this claim can be found in the many honors awarded to the department's faculty, which of course included Ken Arrow, and graduates, one of whom is Alvin Roth. This department owes much of its vision, much to the vision and stature of Kenneth Arrow. Now I turn to organizational recognition of Kenneth Arrow's impact on operations research. Two items in the long list of Ken's arrows are appropriate to mention here. Both are from INFORMS, the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. First, Ken was included in the very first class of INFORMS fellows. And second, and I would say more importantly, Ken received the John von Neumann Theory Award, the citation of which reads as follows. To Kenneth J. Arrow for landmark contributions to the theory of social choice and economic equilibrio, and to an astounding array of fields in the decision sciences. These include decision theory, the theory of risk bearing, the economics of information and organization, dynamic programming, inventory and production theory, linear and nonlinear programming, advertising policy, economics of medical care, theory of job discrimination, economic growth, finance, 
price theory, maintenance policy, economics of education, natural resource policy, and technological innovation. Pretty good list. Kenneth Arrow generously lent his name and wisdom to many causes. Typical of these are his service as an advisory editor of the journal Mathematics of Operations Research and his authorship of numerous essays and reminiscences that illuminate the history of the field. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. So our next speaker is Partha Desgupta. Oh, thank you very much. Does this uh, voice carry too, too much, too little, at the, right at the end? Okay, good. I'll try and keep to the distance. Um, Kenneth Arrow's engagement with what I will call ecological economics here, uh, not so much environmental and resource economics, but ecological economics, dates back to 1990, when a small group of ecologists and economists at Stanford University began, started a monthly seminar. And uh, Ken never said no. Uh, in this case, he had no uh, desire to say no. He came along, the organization was done by others, and he attended every session. The, if you like, the seminar in some, some sense drifted towards uh, the newly reconstructed um, Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in Stockholm in 1991. 1993, the then director, Karl Joran Mehler, an economist of great distinction, um, decided to hold an annual retreat, a weekend retreat in an island of Asco, which was referred to by Mordecai in his talk, very briefly, and it played a very important role in Ken's life for the last 25 years of his life. Uh, this retreat, the idea was to spend about 24 hours with an equal number of ecologists and economists, um, and then, I should tell you that by the about 20 years time, we couldn't tell who was the ecologist and who was the economist, to the extent that uh, Paul Ehrlich, who has always attended it, uh, was uh, referred to in a British uh, Airways magazine as an economist. <laughs> now that's a sea change. Those at the back uh, are young enough not to have been around at that time, but there was a time that is in the early 90s, late 80s, when ecologists and economists loathed each other. Uh, we on the one hand, and when I say we, I mean uh, as a member of my card-carrying economist, I'm not talking personally here, um, thought of ecologists as um, uh, unreflective agitators, and ecologists thought that there should be plague on our house on the economist house. So the sea change in, uh, in the attitudes, albeit in a small group of people, was very much influenced by Ken Arrow. Uh, his presence lent the, uh, the, the gravitas. Now, this met, the, the group met, uh, it, it was a revolving group, but there was a core uh, who invariably attended, Ken being one, um, Paul Ehrlich, Simon Levin, um, and among the younger generation, uh, Scott Barrett, and a number of others. It's an annual meeting, and you chose a theme and discussed and produced a report, a brief report. These were uh, briefs. Now, the records show that of the 24 meetings that took place until last year, uh, Kenneth missed only six. On one occasion, because he had uh, he found on arriving in Chicago that his passport uh, had expired, <laughs> <laughs> so he had to go back, come back to Stanford. Uh, so it was, um, and he he co-signed these briefs, 
and published in various places, including Science, Nature, uh, PNAS, and so forth. What were they about? The co these, were, these papers were signed by 18, 20 people. Um, now, in any newly developed theme, there are mishaps. It's hard, to, it's after the event you say there was a target, there was a goal, there was a name. None of that. You talked, you went for walks, and you drank. Um, and a way of creating a, a field because there were problems that you both, both sides felt needed dealing with and neither could do it on its own. But now that the years have passed, it's possible to give shape to uh, that literature that has come out. And uh, I mentioned 18 papers to which his, his uh, canary was a signatory. These were notes. But he also co-authored uh, five research papers, full artic journal articles, uh, one of them being in the Journal of uh, Economic uh, Perspectives, co-authored with such people as Larry Goulder here, uh, Paul Ehrlich, Cy Levin, Scott Barrett of Columbia University, and a number of others um, in, in various shapes and forms. So what, were the, what was the question that was being raised? And of course, I'm now doing it as an afterthought, because now I can see clear, more clearly what we were aiming for. The global growth experience since the end of the Second World War has offered two conflicting messages. On the one hand, if we look at the state of the biosphere, fresh water, ocean fisheries, the atmosphere is a carbon sink, more generally ecosystems, there is a strong evidence that the rates at which we are utilizing them are unsustainable. For example, the rate of biological extinctions globally today is, exceeds by several orders of magnitude the average rate over the past several million years. This is a serious problem. The mid-20th century years are acknowledged to have been the beginnings of an era that environmental scientists now call the Anthropocene, which has massively altered the process that defined the biosphere. On the other hand, that's the bad news, on the other hand, it is argued by many that just as previous generations in the West had invested in science and technology, education and machines and equipment so as to bequeath to us the ability to achieve high living standards, we in turn can make investment that would assure still higher living standards in the future. The years immediately following the Second World War are routinely praised by commentators for being the start of the golden age of capitalism. So the, that's the conflicting thing and the question is how do you reconcile the two? We should not be surprised that the Anthropocene and the Golden Age of Capitalism began at about the same time. If GDP, uh, market activity, is seen as the, the source of the impact on the biosphere, then we are looking at an expansion of a, by a factor of 15 over a 65 year period. And that's pretty massive, it's never happened before. Um, now, we should not be surprised that the, the, the two the same period began at the same time, namely the end of the Second World War. Um, but you will not, we should also not be surprised that the conflicting signals of the past 65 years do not receive much airing by economic commentators. That's because contemporary models of economic growth and development in large measure ignore the workings of the biosphere. So now, what was, as I now see it, or as we all who have participated in this now see it, our aim was to see whether we could construct an economic indicator, uh, replacing the ones which we currently use, which tracks uh, the economic program in terms of what very often people call sustainability. And I want to develop that argument in the next three, four minutes. So as um, several people, um, Bob Lucas, in particular, uh, pointed out, we're thinking of a world, an uh, indefinite uh, future. Um, and by social well-being now, I'm going to talk, think in terms of intergenerational well-being. It's not just today's well-being, tomorrow's day after, and so forth. Uh, uh, Weighted in, in some way. I don't have to be very precise about how to do that. And as you move through time, you're carrying this social well-being with you. Of course, the past is past, 
So, but there is an infinite future out there, potentially, so you're carrying an infinite series ahead of you. And the question we want to ask in sustainability analysis is, is that increasing or declining over time? All right? So the perturbation that you're looking at is a natural perturbation. You have a program, a development program that you're pursuing, which it could be a country or it could be the whole world, and you're asking whether things are getting better or worse, but not immediate uh, betterment, but overall betterment, taking into account the future generations as well. Now, the, that's one question. We are not usually used to that question in welfare economics. We instead ask the, uh, a different question. What should, be, what should be done? So we look at, we perturb the economy at a moment in time through a change in policy and ask whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. All right? Here, the previous question was not a perturbation that you're actually uh, creating, you're just happening to move through time and that's the perturbation. Now for the, the proposition. Uh, any perturbation to an economy that increases intergenerational well-being raises something which I'm going to call inclusive wealth as well. Similarly, any perturbation that lowers social well-being across the generation reduces that object called wealth. Wealth, in the sense that I'm using the term here, is the social value of all capital assets. And the assets we are thinking of are manufactured capital, obviously, human capital, again, obviously, but natural capital in addition, uh, including the biosphere. And of course, the missing object in conventional measures uh, is natural capital. And th that's the source of the reconciliation of the two conflicting intuitions that um, I just now mentioned. Now, very briefly, um, the proposition which I've just now quoted holds for either type of perturbation, and you might be wondering why, how wealth features in policy analysis. And it is easy to show that the, the, uh, the criterion that we use in social cost-benefit analysis a present discounted value of social benefits arising out of the uh, perturbation is in fact measuring the change in the wealth of the country okay, by the reallocation of the assets that go into the project. So we now have a unified theory of conducting both policy analysis and sustainability analysis with one indicator, namely wealth. So we are back to, I guess, Adam Smith we should be measuring the wealth of nations, not the GDP of nations, not the Human Development Index of nations, or any of the others that are on offer. Finally, just a few brief remarks about uh, where we are going, or where we should be going. Uh, now, st state a proposition in its darkest form. We should read wealth for wealth, adjusted for its distribution among people and for population size. That can be done. Proposition says that inclusive wealth and social well-being are linked by an unbreakable bond and can be stated in either form. In other words, uh, proposition is telling us that means and ends are not in conflict with one another. You're interested in the ends, but if you know the means that bring about the ends, then why then you can measure the means, and that is of course what wealth is about. Because proposition is an if and only if statement, it has no empirical content but it has powerful implications for empirical work and theoretical reasoning. And I want to spend the next the final two minutes discussing that. It says, for example, that governments should instruct their statistical offices to prepare wealth accounts and track movements in wealth through time so as to check whether social well-being has risen under their proposed policies. The change in wealth over a period of time, say a year, is called net investment. But net investment now takes into account the deterioration of the capital assets and the form of natural capital. Okay? Um, the, in the last few years, there have been attempts, and this is where Ken was so useful, so important for the rest of us. Because if you start doing, trying to put numbers, and this is a small group, we're talking about a few people um, working as opposed to the large numbers of government officials generating GDP accounts and so forth. 
Um, it, it's mind-blowing. I mean, you don't you need to wash your hands at the end of the day, maybe even take a dip in the Ganges to clean, cleanse yourself, because you're doing things your mother wouldn't allow you to do and you're messing around with the numbers. <laughs> Kenneth was very adamant that it should proceed. He said, go and read Kuznets' work to begin with, um, because that too was full of uh, 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 illegitimate moves, but of course he knew them. Now, the advantage of the really usefulness of having a tight theory before you start measuring things, that you know what corners you're cutting when you're cutting the corners. And without the theory, of course, you wouldn't know why you're doing what you're doing. So where are we with the numbers? Some years ago, the, the then Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, asked me to chair a commission to uh, inform the federal government or the, the national government of ways to alter the uh, national accounts. Um, and of course, he knew that what I would be asking him would be to uh, convert it into wealth accounts or at least give them as uh, auxiliary data. Fortunately, the secretary of the uh, commission happened to be the chief statistician of the country. So there's some guarantee that the process, processes that, are being, that were ad, uh, advocated in the report are being pursued. But meanwhile, Ken was very keen on doing some empirical work of his own with, with young colleagues like Larry Goulder and others. Um, and so we, some, several papers have been published, so let me give you just finally the, uh, the kinds of answers we're getting. Um, this has been followed by work done by the United Nations Environment Programme through a series of publications called the Inclusive World Report, came out in 2012, on Time for Rio, and then 2014, and the 2016 is about to come out. Um, somewhat late because there was a change in the uh, directorship of the program, of the reports. The latest finding is that of the 140 countries for which uh, as estimates were made of wealth, uh, uh, changes over a period from 1995 to 2015, so that's taken as a unit of time, and you want to see whether it's gone up or down. And by the way, the estimates are based on uh, the natural capital that's in included is a very small fraction of natural capital because of measurement problems. Of the 144, uh, uh, for 40 countries, 44 had per capita wealth going down during this period, most of which also enjoyed growth in GDP per capita. So you can see the two uh, indicators moving across purposes, and we just have to continue working at it to, uh, to improve things. And, but as I said, without Canaro, none of this would have happened because he was willing to take a risk and see how far theory can guide us to better policy. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Partha. So our next speaker is uh, Deborah Satz. All right, so th um, th I also want to give my thanks to the organizers of this um, event. I'm uh, very honored to be here. I was Ken's colleague for almost three decades, during which time he served on the steering committee for the Center for Ethics and Society. But I also want to point out, he was a founding member of the program in Ethics and Society at Stanford. And that, I just want to underscore the natural and too uh, rare connection between ethicists and philosophers and economists that really Ken worked very, very hard uh, to bridge. Just two years ago, when he was 94, he and I co-taught a course on the ethics and economics of inequality that was just a joy um, to teach. As you all know, he's not only an intellectual giant, but to use a technical term, uh, he was a mensch. <laughs> and uh, I can't hope to do justice to all the ways that um, his work and friendship have not only influenced my own work in political philosophy, but that of so many people in ethics and political philosophy. We've heard about his work on climate change, uh, national security, inequality, uh, 
health care. He wrote on uh, essays on uh, John Rawls and Robert Nozick. He published in philosophy journals. He was a bridge builder, not only, as we heard, between theoretical and applied economics, but he was a bridge builder between philosophy and economics. And um, I was very, very lucky myself to have uh, benefited from his enormous um, uh, breadth of interests. So I'm going to only concentrate on one area um, where he's had an important influence, um, and that's democracy. It's a big subject. <laughs> the foundation and much of the meaning of our public life rests on the legitimacy of democracy. Yet as we heard this morning, um, Arrow's impossibility theorem strikes at the heart of democratic justification, purportedly demonstrating that democracy itself is not capable of producing rational or meaningful results. Across the ideological spectrum, political scientists, legal theorists, and economists have found in the theorem a range of disturbing and profound implications for both democratic theory and practice. So judges Frank Easterbrook and Richard Posner have each independently asserted that the theorem suggests that legislators are incapable of formulating intelligible policy. Maybe they're right. Um, uh, uh, the political scientist William Riker argued that social choice theory has put to rest populist majoritarian conceptions of democracy. The political theorist Jan Elster claimed that the theorem showed that the idea of a general will is incoherent. And law professor uh, Frank Michaelman has called the theorem ethically unsettling for anybody committed to the democratic project. So we saw um, this morning that Arrow's theorem basically shows that if we um, uh, impose four very reasonable conditions um, on a social choice function, we are going to be unable to aggregate people's preferences in a way that will maintain um, transitivity. So if we use majority voting, for example, there are individual preference profiles that'll produce social preference cycles violating transitivity. One other way to put the result is like this. A social welfare function that satisfies three very appealing axioms, what um, Eric uh, this morning referred to as unrestricted domain, the independence of uh, irrelevant alternatives and the Pareto principle, has to be dictatorial. It can't be democratic. In light of this insight, the practice of voting looks much less like an exercise in collective self-determination and more like a game of luck. So, very, you know, that sets a huge intellectual agenda for people interested in democratic theory and the legitimacy of democracy. One important strand of work has been devoted to showing that the disturbing implications of Arrow's theorem can be evaded. And this one, one main way this has been done is by producing empirical studies designed to show that voting paradoxes don't arise often in practice. There are a lot of questions about those empirical studies, but I'm gonna put them to the side because I'm more interested in the theoretical um, approaches that try to either water down or drop some of the conditions that can set for a, um, for a social aggregation function, for a, for a procedure. So take the condition known as unrestricted domain. That condition says that there's no restriction on the preferences that can be considered. All preferences will be ranked. But this is not a condition mandated by social choice or by the social choice framework. So for example, an alternative condition would be to say that the domain of a collective choice rule is to be limited to collections of rankings that human beings might plausibly hold or to substantively reasonable individual rankings. So, for example, pr preference restrictions are imposed in some European countries, like Germany, which don't allow fascist or Nazi parties to be on the ballot. 
So a big issue about the theorem turns on the reasonableness of the four conditions that Ken placed on the social welfare function. And in particular, the theorem causes trouble if we accept the idea that the standards to be used for evaluating collective choice decisions and the arrangements for making such decisions are to be constructed only from the individual preferences taken as having equal weight. But there's some good reasons in political philosophy in my neck of the woods, um, we have some good reasons for doubting this condition. That is, in the special setting of binding collective choice, preferences as such may have little, if any, weight. Whatever their role is in explaining individual conduct, they do not, as such, provide a basis for the claims that we can make on others um, that a collective decision needs to be taken into account. So for example, Amartya Sen has drawn our attention to the ways that several of Arrow's conditions interfere with the liberal value that a person has the right to make her own choices with respect to matters that only concern her. Ken himself recognized that unrestricted preferences could be a stumbling block to successful democratic decision making. In his words, and this is from a 1963 paper, quote, the possibility of social welfare judgments rests upon a similarity of attitudes towards social alternatives, close quote. He thought there was, as an empirical matter, often enough similarity to avoid the inconsistency result. Now that's supposed to be an empirical finding, but there's a theoretical, re there can be theoretical reasons for imposing some kinds of similarity um, restrictions. So think about other ideas about collective choice based not on brute preferences, but on shared interests, like in Rousseau's idea of a general will, or Rawls's theory of justice, where all people are said to have fundamental interests in the primary goods of basic liberty, opportunity, income, and wealth, and self-respect. The key point here is that in a democracy, the individual preferences, interests, and values that are to play a role in justifying political principles that apply to arrangements of binding collective choice have to satisfy certain conditions suited to the special problem of justifying such arrangements, and more particularly, suited to justifying the arrangements that captures the idea that people are to be treated as free and equal in the making of binding collective decisions. Once we confine ourselves to inputs that can pass through such a fact filter, then, depending on how these notions are developed, that is precisely what the interests are, the extent to which they're shared, all of which can be modeled, we may well be able to generate a set of principles that define a coherent collective ranking. Spurred on by the seemingly inescapable results of Arrow's theorem, work by Amartya Sen, Jules Coleman and John Fairjohn, Joshua Cohn, Jeremy Waldron, Philip Pettit, Mark Florbey, and David Esland, just to name a few people spanning the philosophy, econ, and political science divides, have attempted to develop differing accounts of collective choice. There's also a line of thought following Ken's work to which he contributed and provided a roadmap in his original book that focuses on weakening the rationality requirement. Perhaps we don't need to have a complete and transitive ordering at every preference profile. And that's especially going to be the case if we um, drop the independence um, condition, but I'm not gonna talk about that as a yet another route. A lot of recent work in political philosophy has looked critically into the strengths and weaknesses of alternative voting systems. So we heard a little bit this morning about majority rule, there's Condorcet voting, border rules, instant runoff voting, um, approval voting, and the like. Most collective choice mechanisms don't, as Ken observed, work badly all the time. His work just proves they sometimes do. And so we have an interest in finding out 
When can they work better and what kinds of supports can we give them to make them work better? Other proposals seek procedures that extend beyond voting, such as deliberation, to make it more likely that people will revise their preferences or in the epistemic model, revise their beliefs to make it more likely that rational social choices can be produced. All this to say that if you look at contemporary political theory and um, theory about democracy, the current work would not look the same without Ken's theorem. Um, Ken, in mounting a seemingly irresistible challenge to democracy, has, as usual, served to deepen our understanding of it. His work set, that did what you think great work ought to do. It set the agenda for theorists of democracy by crisply and clearing, clearly setting out the questions we need to ask about democracy and by helping us to identify different strategies we might consider in responding to its problems. So I want to close by saying Ken wasn't only a great economist, he was in a profound sense democracy's economist. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So our final speaker of the academic program will be Joe Stiglitz. Well, thank you um, for, for inviting me. Um, and we're at, at the point of a discussion all day uh, where normally one would say uh, everything has been said, but not everybody has said it. Uh, <laughs> but I say normally, but we're talking about Ken Arrow, and uh, there is, uh, we've touched on only a, a fraction of, of what he has done. Uh, each of us today has shared with the others the moment we fell under the sway of Ken. For me, it came early uh, in my life, not as early as Ruth Ross, but, but in my second year of graduate school at MIT, Ken had come to, ta uh, to give a course in general equilibrium theory, um, and um, sitting, listening, engaging in the course was mind-bending bend as all the people who've talked to today about being his student. But that semester, uh, actually half my coursework was on uh, Ken Arrow because the other course was given by Bob Solo, who was using as his textbook uh, a, a, a set of lectures that Ken had given just right before called Some Aspects of the Theory of Risk Bearing, which was a set of lectures he had given for the Johansson Foundation in Helsinki. And it was a beautiful set of lectures, and the third lecture was about uh, imperfect information and about not only the question of moral hazard that he was just finishing writing about in the context of insurance, uh, but also the problem of adverse selection. And uh, what uh, was uh, so wonderful about it was that it crisply stated what was a problem, uh, but didn't give you the answer. And uh, the, the reason was the answer was actually quite difficult and difficult enough to preoccupy uh, much, uh, a lot of people in the profession for 50 years. So um, in, in many ways, uh, I'm very thankful for that stimulation of that lecture. And one of the examples for academics, you never know when you write something how influential that one piece of writing uh, can be. The other thing that struck me uh, at the time and strikes me uh, now is here was a person who had done really uh, the d most important work in general equilibrium theory. He had answered a question that had Adam Smith had posed about when is, he didn't pose it quite this way, but uh, the Pareto efficiency of a competitive economy and a question that Balraz asked about the existence. He'd answered those questions and then said, well, maybe that model isn't the right model of the economy and spent much of the rest of his life questioning this foundational uh, work that he, that he had done. And so um, over the succeeding uh, years, as I would work in one topic uh, or another, I would find that uh, Ken had written uh, a foundational article. And most of these have been mentioned, but I want to just uh, highlight some that have not gotten uh, as much attention as they are. Uh, one is he wrote about social capital uh, in a book that uh, Partha uh, co-edited. Um, he wrote about the economics of discrimination, 
uh, a really important uh, piece of work that really undermined Gary Becker's work that sort of said that discrimination couldn't uh, exist uh, because competitive markets wouldn't allow it. And of course, anybody looking around the world uh, in, in our society said obviously Becker was wrong. And the question was, why was he wrong? And uh, uh, his beautiful paper gave an account of that. He did important work on uh, the economics uh, of education. He wrote a beautiful book on organization theory. Um, he did work on re-examining, again with Partha, the basis of consumer theory when preferences uh, 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 depend on relative uh, income and how that affects uh, behavior. Uh, the important work on learning by doing uh, that we studied uh, at uh, MIT. Um, but he also did important work in R&D. And we think of ourselves as the innovation economy. And these two papers written in 1962, one on learning by doing and one on R&D, are really the foundational work on the innovation economy. And um, each of these areas illustrate uh, the theme that I thought uh, Angus brought out so uh, powerfully in the context of health economics, the pervasiveness of market failures, the pervasiveness of externalities, why we have to, uh, why the private market solution doesn't work, and we have to look for other solutions, and, and that in many cases um, we can uh, find uh, solutions either in government or uh, civil society, other, other uh, ways of addressing these issues. And that of course brings uh, me to another topic that's been mentioned but I just want to highlight. Uh, Ken was a person committed to causes and uh, there was, uh, I, I think, not a good cause that he couldn't uh, be enlisted uh, to, to, to work on and to sign a letter, sometimes with uh, people, uh, not everybody being happy with the letter, but, but uh, he, he, was, uh, he, he was committed to try, he believed that economics could create a better society and that people who know how to think well, and he knew that he knew how to think well and, and, and could, could actually make a contribution uh, by putting themselves uh, forward on this. Uh, one area that's been mentioned only once uh, today was uh, his commitment to a disarmament uh, and to peace. And he served as a trustee um, for the Economist for Peace and Security for a very, very long time. And maybe it's fitting to, to note that uh, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize this year is the social organization working for uh, nuclear disarmament. Um, he, he also early came to realize the seriousness of the threat of climate change. Um, and so when uh, I was in charge uh, in putting together the uh, economics part of what was called the second assessment of the IPCC in the early 1990s. And uh, a key issue that's already been mentioned um, was the appropriate rate of discount. Um, with uh, some economists, many economists, arguing for a sufficiently high rate of discount to almost ensure that nothing would be done about it. Uh, we both knew that that was wrong especially if one included the effects of uncertainty. And so uh, Ken and I wrote a paper together showing how uh, with, uh, in the context of the presence of uncertainty, there might even be negative uh, discount rates. And that uh, paper is, is in the uh, uh, report of the uh, IPCC in the second assessment. Uh, this was but one of many ventures that Ken and I got involved in jointly, and let me mention, because of limited time, just one more, uh, but I think may have had uh, important consequences. Back in December of 1980, as China was beginning its transition from communism to a market economy, uh, the Chinese government, through the Academy of Social Sciences, reached out to the National Academy of Sciences and Ken and I were among a very small group of, that went to a conference in Ring Spriggs, uh, Wisconsin, to reflect on how China might best manage that transition. Uh, and then we made a return trip of several weeks uh, the following summer. 
I remember vividly Ken and I arguing for a path of transition with an emphasis on creating the institutional foundations for a market economy, supporting a competitive economy, a gradualist path markedly different from that later taken by the former Soviet Union. I don't know how much what was said affected the critical decisions that were subsequently made, uh, but I do know that the Chinese took uh, 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 very careful notes of what, what was said. But if they even had a small effect on what turned out to be one of the most important events in human history, the moving out of poverty of 800 million people, Kent's contribution to global social welfare on that account alone was enormous. Well, uh, I'd like to uh, share a few personal re reminiscences uh, that I had along the, the lines that uh, uh, Bob talked about, but John has said I have to be very disciplined, not going uh, over uh, my lot of time, but I'll, I'll, I'll just one story, one story, uh, two stories. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, even though I, I got to know Ken uh, every summer I came out to the IM Triple S, the conference, and, and spent some time at, in Cambridge together when he was briefly there. Um, but it was when I came back to, Stan came to uh, Stanford in 1988 that I got to know uh, the many facets of Ken and to become close to Ken and Selma. I suppose the moment that I knew I had earned his trust was when he allowed us to babysit his favorite goldfish while the little pool outside his home was being reconstructed. And David was re remembering this uh, story. When the pool was finished, um, I was, uh, you know, I you have to understand, goldfish die all the time. And uh, I was uh, under constant fear that uh, it would die while it was under my uh, caretaking and my career would be over. But fortunately, when the pool was finished, uh, we were able to return the fish in good health. Same, uh, uh, same fish, I know the same fish. I know them, we, we know them. Um, to, their, to their home where they lived halfway uh, with the arrows. Um, and then to mention one meal, I don't know why meal has become, but Ken was always a good sport. Uh, one evening in Seoul during an uh, East Asian econometric society meeting, Ned Phelps had arranged to have Ned, Ken, and me taken out by one of, uh, uh, of uh, Ned's former PhD students who had successfully followed uh, the dictum that I tell my students uh, that the most important decision in your life is choosing the right parents. And um, uh, especially in American inequality where, where if you choose your wrong parents, uh, life is over. Um, but uh, he had inherited one of the uh, chaibo uh, in Korea uh, which included Asiana Airlines, and uh, so we took it out to an uh, evening uh, of a fantastic dinner, uh, the four of us, but it uh, culminated, and I, I'm not sure that uh, Ken had anticipated this, uh, in a traditional uh, Korean uh, custom of karaoke. And uh, uh, with, with Ken throwing himself into the spirit uh, of, of the singing, and you have to understand, I'm totally tone deaf, so it was, uh, 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 for me it was a disaster, but for uh, uh, Ken and uh, Ned it was, uh, uh, it was a really uh, very enjoyable evening. So the final thing, I, when I left the World Bank and went to uh, Columbia, it quickly occurred to me that there would be multiple benefits of creating an annual lecture in honor of Ken. Uh, Ken was by any measure Columbia's most distinguished PhD. And I thought it would be good for our students to know what they should uh, uh, aspire to. And I, this is also goes, I think, probably for the Stanford PhDs. Uh, what I wanted them to know is that sort of a, the passing mark was a, a PhD like uh, social choice and individual values. <laughs> and this was the norm that we wanted to uh, set for our students. Um, but the other reason is I hope that it would provide a context in which Ken, Selma, and I could regularly get together and have uh, some other people like Bob Solo come down. Um, I have been warned about how hard it was to sustain such a lecture series, but Ken was unique. Um, he, uh, his writing covered such a wide range and with so many devoted students, colleagues, friends, admirers, it proved easy to establish an intellectually thriving and animated series 
Um, many of the contributors to which are here today, and here are just uh, three of the books. Uh, there are two people here, um, John and uh, Partha, who are about to deliver uh, their books. This is a way of twisting their arms. Um, <laughs> and uh, most remarkable was how Ken came every year, both commenting on the paper and giving us some glimpses of how he came to write the paper that was the inspiration of that year's lecture. Um, and what was his inspiration in writing the paper? Last year's lecture by John Ginnikopoulos was to be his last. Perhaps it was fitting that it was given on a topic so close to Ken's heart by someone who was himself so close to Ken and who contributed a brilliant paper to Ken's festschrift 30 years ago. Ken's comments were sharp as always, emblematic of the reverence, awe, and respect of Ken was an email I received from a bright young Indian economist who had been visiting Columbia that day and had managed to engage Ken for a few minutes that evening. He wrote that those moments would be among the, mo the, the moments ch most cherished in his life. We all feel that the moments that we spent with Ken were among the most cherished, cherished in all of our lives. Thank you very much. So a few comments, just uh, announcements. So first of all, uh, you know, Ken made this very, very easy. And not only by giving us so much to talk about, but you know, over the years you'll have a chance to organize many conferences and I've never seen anything like this in terms of positive and enthusiastic responses and, and bringing together such an amazing crowd. So, so first of all, let's thank all the speakers for a great job today. 